I find myself incredibly lucky to have discovered my passions at a very young age. I have always loved reading atlases and almanacs. I was sort of a geography nerd as a young child, so I loved learning as much as I could about other countries. I've also always been a really big fan of pop music, and I definitely got that from my mom. One of my first memories is dancing around the living room to Michael Jackson's Beat It. During my undergraduate years of college, I found one event that brought those two passions together, the Eurovision Song Contest. Good evening, Europe! Good evening, this is David Jacobs speaking from the Royal Festival Hall. And alongside me in these boxes are 10 commentators, each interpreting the scene in their various languages. Euro Division Song Contest, dues points. What, so what's, have you, uh, do you know what this is? Have you heard of it? No, it's something to do with soccer, maybe. Um, Eurovision, I, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of history behind the contest. It started in the 1950s as a way of bringing Europe together after World War II. And the very first editions of the contest were deeply rooted in the French language. There was a rule that your country had to perform a song in your national language. And with France, Belgium, Switzerland, uh, and Luxembourg all competing, French figured pretty prominently at those first few editions of the contest. Now, how does it work? Well, have a look at the Eurovision control room in Brussels. J'appelle Paris. Paris, vous entendez? Oui, ça c'est bien, merci. Les Pays-Bas, s'il vous plaît. 15 votes. 15. Now, in 2019, as things have progressed, a majority of the songs are performed in English. Like Phoenix, but you're my I like like international artists that like aren't really noticed. Like I listen to like people who are like, really popular in Europe but not popular in America, like Mahalia or like Strome. It's a global media phenomenon. It's one of the first live events to be broadcast in the world. It's one of the most watched televised events across the world. And it's worth studying. It's worth figuring out how it tells us who we are, what Europe is, and how other countries uh, engage with each other, especially in terms of music and popular culture. And finally, France. Abba and Celine Dion. I know Celine Dion, but I don't know who Abba is. Are you, are you a fan of Celine Dion? I know her songs, but I'm not like a fan. Like, I'll go watch her in concert. Like, I'll listen on the radio if she's on. This cultural moment that has always I been so deeply rooted in what it means to be European has been expanding. That started in the 70s with Denmark. Israel's participation and into the 2010s when Australia joined the contest. Um, Azerbaijan and Armenia are also a uh, part of the contest. Oh, Eurovision Song Contest. Have you have you heard of it? I've heard of Eurovision. Yeah. What, what's, your, what's your knowledge of it? Um, I know apparently Graham Norton was there, so he wasn't there on his talk show. And I was just like, oh, and it's really popular in Europe. It's like, it's a big thing. In 2019, Netflix announced plans not only to air a recorded version of the Eurovision Song Contest, but also plans to generate an American version of this contest. For, do you think folks in America know what this is, or are you, would you be surprised that most people have not seen or heard this before? No, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I don't think they would. As I've continued to investigate the contest and what it is, it's always been fascinating to me that many Americans have no idea that the contest exists or have any idea what the Eurovision Song Contest is. I have no idea singing song something, no idea. Okay, what is this, what is, what's, the, what's this item right here? 12 points, like dues points at 12 points. So I don't know what 12 points could be. I don't be. know what that is. You don't know what that is? Okay. Italy, 12 points go to... 
Jonara, congratulations, Denmark! Denmark! Denmark, 12 points. Le Denmark, 12 points. For something that has been so deeply rooted in European culture, what does it mean that America is now going to possibly take part? I think it's because we're kind of just, you know, in our own little world. Like, there's no reason for Eurovision to advertise in America because it's Eurovision. There are so many implications that will come into play. How is the contest funded? Will the audience be receptive to it? What will Europeans think as the contest possibly expands into an American audience? The true believers, thou shalt be saved. Brothers and sisters, keep strong in the faith. Is it something you'd be interested in, or...? Um, this kind of sounds like X Factor to me, so, like, yes, but they would have to make it entertaining for me to want to keep watching it. Now, as a master's student of global media and cultures, I'm taking a closer look at what Eurovision is, what it means, and what an expansion to an American audience would look like. Are we headed towards a global song contest? And will Netflix be part of that? There's so many fascinating questions that are still unanswered. What would have to be in it for you to stick around? What would you want to see in it for something like that to be successful? I feel like in like American shows, it becomes too scripted almost, or like they try too hard to like really shape themselves for their audiences. And I'm on a journey to find out what this expansion could mean for American audiences, what it could mean for European audiences, and how will those two worlds come together through media and through culture. Could we have your votes, please? I thought we were going to be left out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs>